Welcome to the Growing in Grace podcast, where you can listen in on some casual conversation about the good news of Jesus without all of the inconsistent religious double talk. If you've ever struggled with feelings of hopelessness, guilt, and despair, or wondered if you're really right with God, it's time to discover the true freedom that comes with the gospel of unlimited and overflowing grace. Welcome aboard. The Growing in Grace podcast is once again on the air. I'm Mike Kapler, the Cap. That's Joel Brzezicki. Hello. Joel Brzezicki, the Breeze Man. The Breeze Man. Remember when I used to call you that on the radio? The Breeze Man. Yeah, it's the good old radio <laughs> days. <laughs> we, we had some memories going on last night. The power was out for us, so I was texting my, my daughter back and forth, and she was asking about a DC talk plaque that oh. I have. Oh, well, yeah. Mm-hmm. That was uh, gifted to me from some people who were running the radio station in the last days. And they let me have that. It's autographed by the DC Talk guys, and it's got my name on it and stuff. I think it's a plaque that celebrated their their platinum of Jesus Freak, their platinum sales. And uh, she wants it. Oh, My daughter wants that plaque. Uh-oh. So I've kind of got her over a barrel right now. I'm trying to think of what can I get from her. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, leverage right there. Yes. Quid pro quo. <laughs> Well, we'll see what happens there. Keep us posted <laughs> on what happens. <laughs> yeah. The old Jesus Freak days, DC Talk, our old radio days. If you've not listened to us very long, I, uh, I don't know if we've talked about this recently, but that's how we met. We met in radio, in Christian radio, and that's how Cap started sharing things with me about the grace of God, and eventually it has to do with how this podcast got started our connection with each other there. And so if not for that, those radio days, no doubt we wouldn't be doing this. We wouldn't know each other from Adam or Moses or anybody. (laughs) (laughs) So we'd still be brothers in the Lord, but we probably wouldn't know each other. But it's cool because, and I I don't want to relive our uh, 15 year anniversary thing again here, our podcast anniversary, but in all of our time Together, we've grown so much in this. 25 years ago, we started learning about the grace of God. I remember doing a a small group in your house, and we had something that we, I think, downloaded online or came from some ministry about the book of Hebrews. And I remember going through that, and I just, there was a lot that I didn't understand. And so it was like we were just trying to figure out some of this stuff. And, you know, it helped, but yet I, there was a lot of stuff. So anyway, fast forward. 10 years, and then another 10 years, and now another five years, 25 years, and here we are, and this stuff is just so wonderful, the whole book of Hebrews, because it talks about how Jesus does away with with everything in the Old Covenant, and here in the church today, we're trying to bring so, so much of the Old Covenant back in, and if people would just have an understanding of what is said here what is written here in this in this one epistle. And of course, we also have Romans and Galatians. We have so many great epistles that contrast the law and grace, that contrast life under the old covenant with life under the new covenant, life in Christ. Uh, there's just so much, but people get zeroed in on the rules and they get zeroed in on verses. And it just takes away from all of this stuff. So, but from where we've gotten... Uh, so far, we were in verse 18 of chapter 10 of Hebrews last week. Now, where there is forgiveness of these, there's no longer an offering for sin. That is such good news. There's never, ever going to be another offering for sin because through the one sacrifice, the one offering of Jesus, there is forgiveness of sins. There is for, uh, remission of sins. They've been taken away. So that's a done deal. That's done. You don't ever have to... You can't offer your sorrow to God. You can't offer your um, sincerest apologies to God and think that that's going to do anything because it's already been done. (laughs) Your sins have already been dealt with, and they're already gone and taken away. So we got some good news right there, and I'll uh, pass it back to you. Yes. um, As as we move forward here, just to reiterate again, uh, you mentioned uh, Hebrews 10, 18, powerful stuff climactic type stuff from this letter. And again, it, to me, it's a little bit of a repeat from what he said in verse 12 and what he's been saying all along. But he, Jesus, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time. Hmm. Uh, you know, some some people will say, 
even people who call themselves a doctor and write books against grace uh, will say things like, the Bible never tells us that your future sins were forgiven. They'll say things like, your, your sins are forgiven up to this moment, but the future sins are not forgiven. They'll say things like that. Well, Jesus' sacrifice, it, it had to deal with all sins. I mean, it had to deal with every single thing that would ever happen. Because you see, people are being born into it, for one thing, really no fault of their own. You know, we, we've talked before about how many sins does it take to make you a sinner? A lot of people will say one. It's really zero because you were born into it through Adam. And that wasn't really your fault, was it? So that had to be dealt with too. Mm. Uh, so all sins for all time through one sacrifice and, and for all time, <laughs> past, now, and future, that had to be dealt with. And that's why he says in verse 18, where there is forgiveness, and there is, as Joel said, there's no longer any offering because there's no longer going to be any bloodshed. Uh, and so I know a lot of people get it in their head that when we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior and believe in him, that's when we're forgiven. I believe personally that this occurred a long time ago, a couple thousand years ago at the cross. And what Jesus performed after his resurrection in, in the Holy of Holies, the real one, I, I believe that's when forgiveness occurred. Now, I'm not saying that everybody is saved. I'm not talking about a universal salvation, but that issue has been dealt with. And now we just simply receive what's already been done by belief. Um, that's just where I'm at. I know some people are uncomfortable. Even some of the top grace teachers out there are uncomfortable with saying everybody's forgiven. I personally don't have a problem with it because I don't believe that forgiveness and salvation are synonymous. But that's just my perspective. You can chew on it and do what you want with it. But let's move on here in, in uh, chapter 10. Uh, therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, therefore, we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus. That, therefore, again, is, is kind of a, a big deal because, um, in other words, we know that we're forgiven. <laughs> now, now we have confidence. And it's by a new and living way, verse 20, which he inaugurated for us. He opened up for us through the veil, through the curtain. That is his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, a sin-like conscience that he talked about earlier in the chapter, and our bodies washed with pure water, and let's hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And Joel, uh, anything you want to add? Oh, I thought my version says, and let us hold fast the confession of our sins without wavering. Uh, oh, no. It doesn't say that, does it? <laughs> It does not say that. That's what that's what I like about this because, again, going back to how we can <laughs> confess all we want, we can offer our sincerest apologies, we can feel the baddest that we can feel about our sins. That's not going to get you clean. You're feeling bad about your sins, your sorrow for your sins, your apologies for your sins, your uh, anything that you're, anything that you would make a deal with God. <laughs> Some people, you know, if you do this, God, I'll, you know, I'll do this. Or if you'll just forgive me for this, I'll do this. No, it doesn't work that way. It's the one offering of Jesus that dealt with everything. And so let us hold fast the confession of our hope, because our hope is in that, the full assurance of faith that we have, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. That all comes from not anything that we do or the, anything that we can work up, no favors that we can do for God, <laughs> nothing like that. It's all based upon the one sacrifice of Jesus. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. And that's not a that's not a thing saying, well, sometimes I really believe this stuff and sometimes I feel like I don't. No, it, don't worry about that. He's just saying that you have this assurance and, and you can hold fast this hope without wavering because God who promised is faithful. It's God who promised, and he's the one who's faithful. Yeah, it's all about the promise. Uh, Galatians chapter 3, right? Right, yeah. The promise of Jesus. Um, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Not for sake. Here's, uh, here's one of those pasted on the wall verses, Joel. <laughs> People love to pluck a verse out and somehow try to tell us what it means in the middle of all this context not forsaking our own assembling together, 
as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So Hebrews 10.25, we don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together. You'll usually hear uh, religious people saying that, see, you're, you're not supposed to avoid church. What would you say about that, Joel? <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's like, uh, well, in, in Hebrews 7, where, you know, like you said, <clears throat> like you say, we've got all this context, we've got all this talk about what God has done for us through Christ, the offering of Jesus, the contrasts of the old covenant and all the laws and rituals and sacrifices, and how the one sacrifice of Jesus did away with it all. And then all of a sudden, in Hebrews 7, the writer says, oh, I need to add something about tithing. I just need to add something <laughs> about tithing, so make sure these people tithe. Well, of course, we went through that. When we talked about Hebrews 7, has nothing to do with tithing. He was using tithing, uh, the, Abraham's tithe, just to, to show how Melchizedek is superior to Abraham, and therefore Jesus is superior to Abraham and to the Levites, who came from Abraham. But anyway, and so same thing here. We got all this stuff that the writer talks about, and then all of a sudden he says, oh, I, I better make sure these people go to church. So I'm just going to add a line in here, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. That means you got to be in church every Sunday morning and uh, every Sunday evening and every Wednesday evening. And then anytime the doors of the church are open, <laughs> some people feel that way. He's really saying nothing of the sort here. Again, remember the context and remember that he's writing to Hebrews who are, he's trying to help them to understand this and he's trying to help them. Under the law, you had to do certain things. You had to do this, you had to do that, and if you didn't, there were consequences. And here he's just saying, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. You're not under the law anymore. You're not under a, you must do this, you have to do that. Just, you know, consider one another and, and stir up this stuff because you have the Spirit of God in you. Now, he doesn't say that here, but he does say that we've been cleansed, we've been sanctified, all these things. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting or encouraging one another, and so much the more you, as you see the day approaching. This isn't a hard, fast rule that he's trying to get the people to follow. He's not trying to say, you better doggone get together every Sunday. You, you'd better just do this. But he's wanting them to encourage one another. You meet together because you've been under this uh, all these this old way for many, many years, and you're going to need some encouragement in remembering the truth of this new covenant that I've been sharing with you. I, th I think that's what he's saying here, rather than a hard, fast uh, rule about, um, about how they have to do anything. A few seconds if you want to add anything to that, otherwise we can move on to next week. <laughs> well, let me just talk about what we're going to talk about uh, next week. We thought we might get to it this week, but you know, um, <laughs> there's a, a, a another one of those verses, Joel. We just addressed one in verse 25 of Hebrews 10. There's another one in Hebrews 10:26, and we referred to it uh, in past programs that we're coming to it. And that is that people get scared when they see this. And this is one of those verses that people will come back to us with and say, "Well, what about Hebrews 10:26 through 30?" I mean, this is this is heavy stuff here. We're being threatened. Our salvation is being threatened by what's being written here. That that's the way people will see it. And 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 the verse is: if if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. We're going to talk about that next week, right here on the Growing in Grace podcast. And what does it really mean in context? This has been Growing in Grace with Mike Kapler and Joel Brzezinski. Heard online through various internet sources around the world each week. Access past programs by visiting growingingrace.org. Share it with a friend and listen again next week for more Growing in Grace.